all care deeply about our community and about our planet, which is why we're all here today to learn from these fabulous experts who have joined us today. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. I'm joined by John Bennett, who is the co-chair of the Aspen Airport Visioning Committee, and uh, Greg Poshman, the chair of the Board of County Commissioners, was going to join us up up here on stage to welcome you all. And uh, since he's running late from a meeting, I want to just say a few words on behalf of Greg Poshman and the Board of County Commissioners. Um, Pitkin County initiated the airport visioning process last year with the goal to reach an airport plan based on the best information and public engagement possible. This has been a process filled with enlightening, exasperating, and vigorous conversations, <laughs> and a lot of learning along the way. One thing that they have learned is that commercial aviation technology is changing rapidly, and that will affect the aircraft we fly on in the next decade. So, um, as always, we are all confident that a community of minds given good information will reach the smartest conclusions. Um, we want to recognize Meg Haynes and John Bennett and Jackie Francis for uh, their tireless work facilitating the visioning process, our county staff for providing process support, and the Aspen Institute, including uh, Jillian Scott, for hosting us here. Um, and now I want to welcome to the stage John Bennett, um, who will give uh, some introductory remarks about why we're here today. Thank you, John. Thanks, Crystal. And uh, again, welcome to all of you. <laughs> Members of the Airport Vision Working Groups have been focusing intently and digging into a great many details related to our future Pitkin County Aspen Airport. Today's symposium by contrast, really, represents a chance to step back from the planning details and the immediate hard decisions that we've all been working on. This is an opportunity to think broadly about how we can expect the world of aviation to change over the next 10, 20, or even 30 years, and how future aircraft may differ substantially from today's. In this afternoon's presentations, we'll be looking at the future through the lens of carbon reduction, and we're doing this for several good reasons. First, one of the primary design goals established relatively early on by participants in the airport vision process is a 30% reduction in CO2 and other emissions from our airport. Second, because fuel efficiency and emissions reduction are driving forces in modern aircraft design, and they'll profoundly affect what we'll see in our skies in future years. And third, because reducing our community's carbon footprint is a major goal shared by all three of our Upper Valley governments, Pitkin County, Aspen, and Snowmass. And I'll offer a fourth reason, this morning's news. If you woke up today, like I did, and saw those extraordinary photos of the floods in Venice, or read about the 19 below zero weather in Montana and the sub-freezing temperatures pushing into the Gulf of Mexico in the first half of November, or if you saw the report this morning that we've now had 417 months in a row, that's 35 consecutive years of above average temperatures around the earth, then little doubt could really exist about the timeliness of today's topic. I'm gonna to stop there and just say again, thank you all very, very much for joining us. And it's now a pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's symposium, Roger Ballantyne. We're thrilled that Roger is moderating this discussion. He chairs the Aspen Institute Winter Energy Forum, which convenes about 45 experts from corporations, governments, academia, and nonprofits to discuss key issues in the space of clean energy innovation and deep decarbonization. Roger served as a senior member of President Clinton's staff and chair of the White House Climate Change Task Force. He's a cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School and a member of the Connecticut, D.C., and Supreme Court Bars. Please join me in a warm welcome for Roger Ballantyne. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. It's um, great to be back uh, in, in Aspen. I, I hadn't heard, or at least hadn't heard, John, your description of the 
innumerable number of consecutive months of above average temperatures. I think we're entering into a Lake Wabagon kind of situation uh, here where we're going to, it can't always be above average. We're going to have to kind of redo the, uh, the mean here a little bit. Um, so I uh, have the great uh, pleasure and often frustration of um, spending my days every day as part of my day job worrying and trying to find solutions to climate change. Um, and uh, in my career, I've spent a lot of time uh, focusing on climate at kind of the multinational level, the, the, the country level, or at the national level. That, 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 um, that gig's a little uh, slow right now. Um, or at you know, state levels. But the fact is that to address this extraordinarily complex challenge, action and awareness, not necessarily in that order, but awareness followed by action needs to occur uh, at the multinational level, at the national level, at the state level, at the county level, at the local level. And I was really, really excited to hear about this particular forum. Aspen's not your average uh, community, uh, but more and more we're seeing uh, communities around the country realize that climate change is an existential crisis to their way of life and perhaps more importantly to the uh, welfare of future generations, and are asking tough questions uh, about what they can do, what communities can do, or what actions that communities are otherwise taking for other reasons, stopping to ask, what's the climate change impact of this? So I'm thrilled to see that these are the type of discussions that are informing um, some of the decisions you all are dealing with here uh, on a local basis. So not to, to repeat what I think everyone knows, which is the science is telling us that we have a real problem on our hands. Uh, we know what the solutions are, at least at a high level. Uh, we've been told very clearly that we need to essentially decarbonize our entire economy by mid-century. Our economy is made up of multiple sectors. Some are easier to decarbonize than others. Uh, electricity, transportation, heavy industry, agriculture, um, they're all pose their own unique set of challenges. And then within those sectors, transportation being the one we're going to talk about today, it's going to be harder to decarbonize aviation, for example, than personal transportation. Personal transportation, uh, light duty transportation, probably easier than long haul transportation. Rail, probably well within our ability to do. Shipping, less of a problem. Aviation really stands out as the most difficult one out of that um, transportation nugget. Therefore, to tackle an issue this uh, difficult and to really have a, a meaningful discussion about it, you need really smart people who know what they're talking about, and lo and behold, we have three of them uh, with us today. So here's how the, the, the format's going to go today. I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker. Um, we're going to have a 20-minute presentation. I'll introduce the second speaker, same thing, third speaker, same thing. Then we'll all go up here on stage, and we'll have a conversation uh, amongst us uh, for a bit. We're going to pause, take a break. And then the rest of the session is going to be open to your uh, questions. I would ask that we, we hold our questions so each of the three speakers has had their chance uh, to present. Uh, and then we'll have an, uh, a good interactive um, discussion uh, fueled by um, the presentations you're going to hear. So let me start with uh, introducing our first speaker. Um, we are very fortunate and was very pleased to see that Kevin Walsh is, um, Kevin Welsh is joining us here today. Kevin um, uh, has served in various aspects and various places in, this, in the federal government, each of which central to the issues we're talking about here today, specifically with regard to avi aviation at the Federal Aviation Administration. He runs the Energy and Environment Program there, is in charge of developing policies and strategies and programs and projects uh, around energy and environmental issues. Um, prior to that, Kevin was at the White House serving on the National Security Council where he was working on climate change issues and at the State Department where he uh, worked on those issues uh, as well. Um, so Kevin has a very deep uh, sense of, of the national picture around climate change and aviation. I'll tell them also the multinational uh, efforts uh, around this as he is the energy and environment representative of the International Civil Aviation uh, Organization. He'll tell you more about that, but please join me uh, in welcoming Kevin Welsh. Thank you, Kevin. 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Now I realize I can't even see any of you with all these lights up here. Um, uh, but thank you, Roger. And as he said, I'm uh, Kevin Welsh. I'm the director of FAA's Office of Environment and Energy. Uh, so I guess start with a disclaimer, which is I don't personally work on, nor does my office, anything to do with what's currently going on here in Aspen. So I won't be able to answer any questions on that topic. Um, but what I do do, what my office does do, our mission is to understand, manage, and reduce the environmental impacts of aviation. And we do that through research, uh, technological innovation, policy development, and outreach. Uh, and so in, the, in that context, uh, today I wanted to talk to you um, really to give an overview, uh, thinking about the future of aviation um, and the carbon challenge and what we're doing. And I think before we get into the future, we need to talk a little bit about uh, what things look like today and where we've come. So I'll start there. And then I'll talk a little bit about where FAA has come and what we're doing um, to actually reduce emissions through technology, through operations, sustainable alternative fuels, um, as well as goals and policies. So to start, let's just talk a little bit about aviation and the role it plays in the United States. Uh, this slide throws a lot of numbers up there about the economic benefits or role of aviation in the U.S., 5.1% of U.S. GDP, 59.9 billion uh, in the U.S. trade balance. And so these numbers kind of start to give you a sense, but I think even more than that, probably most of us have a pretty good sense of the prevalence of aviation in the U.S. in our lives and visiting our family and traveling for work and going on, on trips, on vacation, right? It just, it, it plays a really important role, um, including, e including commerce. Many of us have probably ordered from Amazon. Maybe I'll just start with a question. How many people in this room by a show of hands have flown in the last three months on an airplane? Okay, yeah, I still can't see most of you, but it looks like most of you raised your hand. So I think that's just another indication about the role aviation plays. It's pretty significant, right? So let's, Turning a little bit more, putting a little bit more granularity on that, in 2018, for the first time ever, there were one billion passengers um, f flew in the U.S. on domestic and international carriers. There was 4.8% annual growth last year. Over the last two years, it's been 8.5% growth. So even for the United States, a relatively mature aviation country, uh, because our economy is doing well, because it's an important part of our economy, it's continuing to grow. Contrast that with a country like India, where developing countries really see aviation as integral to their economic development. India, a country of 1.3 billion people, had just under 200 million passengers in their system last year. Uh, and they've had about 20% annual growth for the last few years. Uh, so, you know, we have mature markets like the U.S., and we see growth. We also have developing countries um, that very much see aviation as interlinked to their economic development. But that's not really the end of the, the story, because aviation is also relatively efficient and has a pretty strong track record of efficiency improvement over time. Uh, so you, what you see in this chart uh, is passengers in the U.S. system dating back to 1991 and fuel use. And if you look on the left-hand side of the chart, you'll see that in the 90s, as aviation grew, the fuel use and therefore the emissions correlated relatively well uh, with the growth. Um, and then around 2000, really coinciding with 2000, September 11th, we saw a fall off in aviation traffic in the U.S. and then a rebound um, and then the 2008 uh, economic downturn and then really the last few years a real strong uptick uh, in aviation in the U.S. But one thing you'll notice in the second half of the chart is fuel use and emissions have not increased at the same rate as the number of passengers. In fact, since the year 2000, we're using about the same fuel and have about the same emissions in the system as we did in 2000, yet we're carrying one-third more passengers in the U.S. system. So there's been tremendous effic efficiency gains over the last several years, including through new aircraft technology, improved operations, um, and a whole range of factors. Another way to look at it is through passenger miles per gallon. So how far, how, so how far does a passenger travel on one gallon of gas? Uh, back in 1991, it was 34 passenger miles per gallon. Today, it's 57 
passenger miles per gallon. So there's been an over a 70% improvement in, in efficiency since 1991 in the system. So again, the, the sort of context I'd like to bring here is sort of the two sides of this coin. Uh, on the one hand, you have aviation being integral, but growing. On the other hand, we've had a track record of efficiency improvements, and I think, as said at the outset, there's a natural incentive to reduce fuel burn, natural economic incentive to reduce fuel burn that aligns with reducing carbon emissions. So that brings us to kind of where, where are we today looking forward and what are the opportunities to reduce emissions? So this chart, uh, it's a bit of an eye chart, it's a bit detailed on here, but I'm showing it because it's a consensus agreed chart internationally um, looking at emissions out to 2050 um, and then ver what various um, things can do to reduce those emissions. So in light blue, you'll, you'll see the, the estimates on technology and how technological improvements can reduce emissions out to 2050. The salmon color is operational improvements. And then below that, there's a gap, but there are things like sustainable alternative fuels that can address that gap. And actually, we'll zoom in here on that chart because fundamentally, I think, as Roger said, there's only so many things you can do to reduce aviation carbon emissions. The top blue line is a forecast. It could go up or down because forecasters are not always right. There are also measures to address demand and growth. Uh, the next is technology. Now this technology up here, this slice of the pie, is a group of independent experts, governments, and industry experts that came together to come up with an estimate of uh, what the technology, what benefits the technology would provide out to 2050. Uh, but that's not to say that is a hard limit, right? We, we likely will see greater technology improvements over the next 25 to 30 years beyond what is estimated on this chart. The next slice is operations. How do you improve the system so that aircraft are flying more efficiently from point A to point B? Uh, there's a lot of work going on in that area and there's opportunity, um, again, to further reduce emissions there. And then as, as mentioned, there's a gap. One of the things that my office at FAA has focused on for over a decade is sustainable aviation fuels, fuels that have a lower life cycle carbon footprint than regular petroleum fuels. Um, and those are, are uh, you know, a promising way uh, to address emissions, though in need of commercial deployment and scale up. And then the last item is, is policy and goals. What can governments do uh, to put in place policies and, and goals to incentivize further reducing carbon emissions. So turning to technology, and uh, I'm a lawyer by training, uh, policy, policy person, but I have a lot of smart uh, engineers that work on my team, so I'm not gonna get too much into detail on, on the technology, but I'll talk about the programs that we have. Uh, number one, we have a center of excellence that's university-led. It's led by Washington State University and MIT, and there are 16 universities that are funded about $15 million per year by FAA uh, to do research on an aviation environmental topics. And they do work to understand environmental impacts of aviation. They uh, consider new technologies and they look at how those new technologies can be integrated into the aircraft fleet and what the potential benefits over t are over time. Uh, so a lot of our work in my office is managing projects that universities are out there running looking at this issue. Uh, the second program that I wanted to mention is called the CLEAN program. It's a mouthful. It's the Continuous Lower Energy Emissions and Noise Program. And it is a partnership between FAA and aerospace industry manufacturers to mature technologies that will reduce emissions and noise and also help deploy alternative jet fuels. Um, and why this program is really important, I'll talk about NASA in a moment, um, but FAA in general our resources are pretty limited in terms of what we can do in research. Um, so this program seeks to partner with manufacturers and identify promising technologies and either move them faster to market and to be deployed in the fleet or to take technologies that are on the shelf and there isn't an incentive uh, right now for manufacturers to develop those and to work with them to take those technologies off the shelf and put them in existing aircraft. Um, and some of the things that we do uh, really focus on how do you make the existing engines more efficient? Can you use lighter weight materials uh, that will still be durable and resistant to high temperatures, but also reduce the weight of the engine, thereby increasing efficiency? 
Uh, so there's a lot of uh, promising technologies that have gone through that program that are actually showing up on aircraft now. Um, and we're about to enter a third five years phase starting in 2021 um, with, a, with a new round of technologies and goals for those technologies. I did want to mention NASA because when we think of, from a US government perspective, when you think about aircraft technology, you can't, you can't talk about it without talking about NASA because they have by far the lion's share of the resources and the ability to really look out further into the future at novel and innovative uh, aircraft tech and engine technologies. So NASA's Advanced Air Transport Technology Project is focusing on five areas, including electri electrified aircraft powertrain technologies, um, novel engine and airframe integration, so putting engines in different places than you traditionally see them to make airplanes more efficient, uh, small core gas turbine propulsion, ultra-efficient wings, more, more efficient wings than we have today, um, and un unconventional aircraft structure. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on at NASA, and together at FAA and NASA, we actually work quite closely in coordinating our research uh, so that we're not duplicating each other um, and that we're using our research dollars most wise wisely. So I'm not going to spend time on operations because uh, give, given the time we have today, but I did want to spend some time talking about sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, as I said, use of SAF can result in lower life cycle carbon emissions relative to conventional fuels. FAA has been working on uh, this topic for over a decade, actually dating back to 2006. And a large part of our focus has been on ensuring that they're safe for use and that they can be dropped into existing aircraft. So when we talk about sustainable aviation fuels, we're talking about fuels that today you can fuel an aircraft and no technology changes are needed. Um, in fact, in 2018, over 1 million gallons of uh, SAF were used in the United States on commercial flights and uh, business jet flights uh, produced from a facility in, in Los Angeles. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, the real challenge is to scale up commercial development and deployment. Uh, and so if you go back to that chart that I showed in the beginning, it's now filled in with green, which represents the potential for, alter for sustainable alternative fuels to further reduce emissions. Um, but I emphasize potential because right now it's at a very small level and uh, the challenge is really scaling it up to a commercial level and ensuring that it's sustainable and reducing emissions and having an agreement on those life cycle reductions. Uh, just, just to note, uh, the principal way that FAA has worked on alternative fuels is through something called the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative. Uh, and it's, it's basically getting all of the stakeholders that are interested in sustainable fuels, whether that's airports, airlines, um, government agencies together um, to really coordinate and, and focus together to scale up um, sustainable alternative fuels, particularly given um, in years past, but even today, more of the attention has been focused on uh, sustainable biofuels for ground transportation. So part of this is to make sure that there is a market for aviation. And then the last chart on this um, is just the existing production. So there's uh, two facilities currently in operation, two under construction, and four uh, in planning in the United States. And so within three years, we'll go from that 1 million to likely 250 million gallons, a pretty su substantial leap. In, and, and we're actually seeing that commercial scale up now, um, but it's got a lot more to go um, to, to meet the needs of the current system. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was goals and policies. Uh, and of course, on goals, um, this is important because there's a lot of discussion about uh, goals. Uh, Roger mentioned decarbonization mid-mid-century. Uh, so the near-term goal for aviation that's actually been agreed internationally is called carbon neutral growth from 2020. Um, and what, what that really means is that even though, the, as you saw in that chart, the aviation sector is going to continue to grow, it's a commitment um, through all of the means available to ensure that the net emissions from the industry are no higher than 2020 levels. And, and in a minute, I'll talk about uh, an offsetting mechanism that's been put in place that's going to help achieve that. On the longer term goal, the aviation industry, not governments, but the industry has a goal of 50% reduction in emissions below 2005 levels by 2050. 
Um, and then even just this week, uh, Qantas Airlines announced a commitment to net zero by 2050. Um, and when we think about goals in the US, and there's a, there's a lot of discussion internationally about coming up with a long-term goal, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot that goes into it, but one is understanding whether it's an aspirational goal, whether it's a, real, a realistic bottom-up goal, figuring out, you know, setting a goal that's actually gonna be a, gonna, gonna have some measure of achievement, and then also gaining buy-in internationally from countries around the world. And as you probably can tell uh, from the example of India versus the United States, getting consensus internationally on these issues is very challenging, um, particularly for countries that see uh, aviation as their pathway to further economic development. On policies, again, we, we could spend a long time talking about these, um, but certainly incentives, like incentives to purchase fuels, uh, standards. In 2017, we, uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization adopted an aircraft fuel efficiency standard. So starting on January tw uh, 1 of next year, there will actually be a mandatory fuel efficiency standard for new aircraft that are produced. Um, and then lastly, and probably most importantly, certainly in the near term, is market-based measures and the Corsia program for international aviation. So carbon offsetting for international aviation. Uh, in 2016, the 192 member countries uh, of the International Civil Aviation Organization decided to implement a carbon offsetting measure for international aviation to achieve the carbon neutral growth goal. So what does that mean? <laughs> uh, it, it means that aircraft operators will be required to purchase emissions offsets for their emissions over a 2019-2020 average baseline uh, for, for emissions above that baseline. And this is for international flights. So if airlines can't reduce their emissions through technology, operational improvements, or sustainable aviation fuels, uh, they will be required for their international flights to purchase emissions offsets. Why is it significant? It's a global measure that's effectively putting in, in, in place a, a price uh, on carbon for international aviation. Uh, what are the challenges? Well, a couple. One is it's an offsetting program, so it's getting reductions from outside the sector, and in particular there's a need to make sure that there's credible uh, supply and source of offsets to ensure that actual reductions are happening. The other big challenge, of course, again, comes back to maintaining international agreement and buy-in. Um, and that's been challenging. While there's full support going forward, countries like China, India, Russia, and others um, continue to raise concerns about this type of program. Uh, so it's, uh, we're proving the concept right now, and it's really a phased implementation. So um, we're in the middle of setting the baseline, uh, requiring airlines to report on their um, operations and their emissions, and then beginning in 2021, that's when they'll start having to offset. Um, so I, I don't even know where I am in my time. Oh, five minutes. So I went much faster than I thought I would, which as sometimes happens. Um, but I guess I'm not going to take uh, too much further time now. I think coming back to the sustainable alternative fuels piece, um, we really do see a lot of promise in that because of the opportunities to start reducing emissions now. So in addition to the work that's going on in technology and operations, uh, I was recently at um, a conference uh, for the National Business Aviation Association. And actually, many of the aircraft that flew to that conference, they, they fly um, some jets into that conference, flew on alternative fuels. And all of the aircraft leaving that conference flew on alternative fuels. Um, and Gulfstream Aerospace actually has a contract with the facility in Los Angeles to purchase, uh, uh, to purchase alternative fuels. Um, so there's opportunities now uh, to sort of go beyond and help um, provide an incentive to scale up alternative fuels. Uh, so with that, I know that I covered a lot pretty quickly. I'm, I'm certainly, when we, when we get to questions later on, I'm certainly happy to go into any of the topics that I covered. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Pete Savagian. Um, Pete is uh, Senior Vice President at, um, uh, for Engineering at Ampere. Ampere is one of these innovative uh, airline companies that is trying to build a better mousetrap. 
Uh, Pete will tell you uh, all about that, but this involves uh, electrification. And there's probably not so many people uh, in the country, if not the world, who know more about the electrification of transportation than Pete. Uh, among other things, he was at uh, GM and central to GM's vehicle electrification programs spanning the EV1 um, early 80s? When, did, when was the EV1? 90. 90, uh, all the way through uh, the Chevy Bolt, uh, and I'm a proud Chevy Bolt uh, owner, so thank you, uh, thank Pete, you. Uh, for that. So uh, Pete has a lot of uh, expertise that uh, aligns with um, what we want to talk about today. We're very pleased to have you here, Pete. Come on up and share your thoughts. Well, thanks for that introduction, and uh, I'm so happy to be here and uh, be asked to represent our small startup company uh, working to electrify uh, aviation in a practical way, starting with small aircraft. Uh, I had a long career working on electric vehicles and found it very rewarding, and I see a few parallels uh, to the emergence of electrified aviation and decided to become one of the 10.6 million people in the U.S. employed in this uh, industry. I'm on a real steep learning curve, and it's, it's great to be able to do that at this stage of my career. And so I'm happy uh, to be able to uh, come here uh, and thank you to the Aspen Institute and to the Airport Visioning Committee for asking for perspective from a startup in this space, and I'll do my best to represent that. So what you see here is uh, our engineering test bed. That's a Cessna 337 hybrid aircraft, and it's been flying since May of this year. It's the world's largest uh, hybrid aircraft by uh, passenger capacity and uh, payload uh, lifting capability. We have a longer term vision, uh, doing all those nice optimal things that NASA's working on with uh, airframe and energy storage and wing design and propulsors. And uh, long term, we believe in the electrification of aviation will allow us to make dedicated aircraft that have maybe two or three uh, times the efficiency of aircraft today. But things have to get started in kind of a step-by-step -step and uh, linear way. And so that's really mostly what our, our company's all about. So we said uh, earlier, uh, I think everyone had a show of hands about, uh, or most folks had been on a plane in the last three months. Can I see another show of hands? How many people were ashamed to be on a plane? Okay, so we have a few. And this is kind of an emergent consciousness about our CO2 footprint and the magnitude that uh, air traffic has in our CO2 footprints. And uh, I think in Germany they call it uh, Flugenscham, and uh, in Sweden it's called Fliegskam. And in, in the US we haven't named it yet because I don't think enough of us feel it. But if you look at the world of automobiles, uh, the amount of CO2 made by aircraft uh, is equal to about a, uh, a quarter of those one billion cars operating. So it's an awful lot. And in addition, there are other pollutants uh, that come out of uh, the aircraft that are basically unmitigated uh, into the atmosphere, including NOx, particulates, uh, and others. And it might go uh, without saying, but when it studied the effectiveness of CO2 at global warming when emitted at altitude is about twice of what it is when it's emitted at ground level. So this is really something to pay attention to. Likewise, the other pollutants tend to be, uh, you know, act more aggressively when emitted at altitude. Now, the good thing about working uh, on reducing the CO2 in this space is there's an opportunity to save money. And with a uh, a kind of a capitalist incentive uh, gives rise uh, to a whole lot of innovation and creativity and risk taking and that's what our little company, that's what we breathe on. Uh, and so what we see is the ability to reduce fuel costs in the operation of aircraft and especially starting with small aircraft, we see a, a cost savings as high as 90% is possible. Uh, also uh, maintenance, uh, electric propulsion systems and energy storage, uh, require really less attention. Uh, there are less moving parts. Uh, there's less extreme temperatures involved. 
and so uh, we see the opportunity uh, to reduce costs. So this is really uh, a window, our, our business window, to get started and, and offer something of value beyond uh, all the good reasons to electrify aircraft. It's, uh, it's important that there be a capital incentive to do so. And so uh, you could look at the aviation business. It's a tough business, uh, but there is an incentive. And so we can get the attention of small uh, cargo uh, short haul carriers. We can get the attention of small uh, people carrier uh, airlines that do island hopping and things like that. They're anxious to get started. Uh, they want to do their part for CO2, but they also want to build for themselves a better business. And so they're interested in electrifying aviation for those reasons. Uh, there are some customer incentives as well. Uh, and there's airport stakeholder incentives as well. And that is the, 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 the possibility of having zero direct emissions associated with the aircraft. That the emissions, there's still a long tailpipe, but the opportunity for those emissions to be done in a centralized uh, or to be, when the energy is produced, uh, the electricity is produced in a centralized way, uh, potentially from you know, zero carbon sources uh, or just improved sources with improved uh, remedies. So zero direct emissions and, and any of the other emissions that, that enter the atmosphere around airports or you get some particulate maybe that comes from diesel that lands uh, that you can see on your property and you imagine you're breathing. Uh, there's the promise for the stakeholders of making that improvement. Also the idea of ultra quiet uh, takeoffs and landings. Um, in a fully electrified aircraft, this is true. Uh, in a partially electrified aircraft, there's less of a reduction. And when I say partially electrified, what I mean is a hybrid aircraft. So just like some of you might drive a Chevy Volt uh, or a plug-in uh, Prius or any one of the other uh, great plug-in hybrid cars. A similar idea uh, is used for hybridizing aircraft where some of the energy comes from petroleum, but it's a reduced amount and it's displaced with a, a, a like amount of uh, electric energy, so partially electrified. It's a, it's a good first step, it's a partial first step, and it has partial effect. It's not yet ultra quiet, but it's quieter. So electrification helps with stakeholders in that way. There's a secondary effect because of the elasticity of air traffic business. Um, when costs are reduced about 10%, uh, business picks up about 40%. And so if we can make a meaningful dent in the reduction in the operating costs of an airline, the variable cost of flying, they can expect to get a lot more takers for tickets. A lot of routes that maybe were uneconomical can open up. And so there's a chance to uh, improve the operating efficiency that Kevin talked about by traveling. Uh, more, uh, more people, uh, more seats, or more occupancy of a plane that's maybe designed to hold uh, 50 people, actually does hold 50 people, and not like the one I flew here from Salt Lake City, which was run at about 50% capacity. We were not getting 50 miles per gallon on that flight earlier today. In addition, there's operating efficiency in a tipping point. To move us from a hub and spoke model to a point to point kind of connection. So this is a, a kind of efficiency, so rather than flying through the intermediary city, having the layover time, uh, we go point to point. And we not only save fuel, but we also save time, which is maybe the most valuable thing we really have. Uh, and so we see the opportunity of cost reduction having the effect of improving the operational efficiency in a secondary way and therefore also reduce carbon emissions that might be involved. So what, what enables this really? And it kind of all comes down to a couple of things, uh, the biggest of which is the battery specific energy. So I've got a few charts here that will kind of go deep into a few numbers. Uh, to talk about it. Uh, but first I want to reflect for a second in my time at General Motors when I worked on the EV1, it went in production at 96. Um, we had a battery specific energy of 29 watt hours per kilogram, 29. And the Tesla 3 that I drive every day has a, a battery energy density of 270 watt hours per kilogram measured at cell level. So it's almost a tenfold improvement 
over that 23-year uh, period. And on a compounded annual basis, that's about 8% a year over a long period of time. And I can tell you, when we had 29 on the EV1, we thought that was a great number. We thought we really did well. But that 8% is marched on. And uh, this chart here uh, has a few curves. Um, you see the uh, kind of the ri rising uh, parabolas there uh, represent different increases in uh, battery specific energy year on year going forward, ranging from 2.5% uh, to 7% a year, and then one S curve there in blue, which probably represents what the author here, Martin Bradley from Boeing, thought back in 2015 when he penned this chart. And he used it to kind of show that it will be decades before the largest aircraft are likely to be fully electrified or partially electrified. But our little business is interested in the beginning of this curve. It's interested way down here in this lower corner with batteries that exist today or will exist in a year or in three or four or five years. And what it tells us is that the slower moving aircraft, the shorter range aircraft, the smaller aircraft are the earliest rational candidates for full or partial electrification. And indeed, that's what we're working on. And to describe the business problem or the business opportunity, uh, if you'll bear with me for a couple more uh, graphical charts to kind of set the landscape up, we can look at the range along uh, the x-axis here of, of miles driven, and it's more complicated than that in aircraft. There's payload and range, both matter. Uh, but if we just kind of normalize a few things and think in terms of flying range, and we think how useful that range is, and we take a look at the kinds of customers that we expect to see and have them below the axis here in, in, uh, along the y-axis on the amount of the addressable market. And we draw a curve here in green. This would be a, 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 a airline that has a fleet of planes that almost all their routes, about, we get to about 100% of their routes uh, at about 100 miles. Uh, we can satisfy uh, all of their routes. They're fixed route flyers. Uh, they fly. Uh, maybe throughout the Hawaiian Islands, carrying people from uh, one island to another, tourists back and forth, they're generally not going to fly very far. Uh, 100 miles is really all they need, and because it's a fleet, um, there's not the occasional you know, 600 mile flight. They're all pretty tidy. And there's other kinds of uh, airlines, though, that go much further. And uh, uh, it may take us, uh, you know, maybe some flights, in fact, go four, five, six hundred miles. And so um, we could look at the aggregate, and that aggregate curve is a real curve. And if we look at about uh, 100,000 short haul flights a year in the US, it falls on that curve. If we look at FedEx's short haul fleet, not their, their big point to point uh, Memphis to LA routes, but their smaller routes to get them into their sort hubs, it falls along this black line where you see uh, they get to about 50% of their flights, about 150 miles. And so it tells us about the business opportunity, about how far our planes have to fly. And if we go on top of the x-axis and look at battery-specific energy, so this is that maturity of how great are these batteries, and we put a relevant range on here, and take a look at where we could buy, and this is at a pack level, not a cell level, so it changed it up a little bit. So instead of 270, if we look at a really good battery pack, be about 220 watt hours per kilogram at a battery pack level. And so that's a, that's a relevant benchmark uh, reference. And if we look at easy to do batteries in green, which would be less than that, or harder to do, and emerging technology batteries for aviation above that line, up to about 500 watt hours per kilogram, we can look at the opportunities for the electrification of the short haul fleet. So the most obvious thing is we'll just make an electric aircraft. And if we look at electrifying a small aircraft, uh, we get a plane that might uh, fall in this blue region here, uh, strictly electric, fully electrified, but with a rational range of about 80 miles or so with today's batteries, maybe a little higher, maybe 90 in that space. And if we drop that line down and look at the addressable market and kind of take some relevant benchmarks about how much of the market we can expect to get, you can see an aggregate we look at really the meat of the market, that size aircraft 
fully electric would probably satisfy, at least by our measure at Ampere, about 20% of the market. So we're not so sure we can make a great product out of that today. But there's other opportunities for hybridization and the way to start, just like in the mass market of electric automobiles, it happened with hybrids first and then plug-in hybrids and now fully electric vehicles. We think there's an intermediary period like that. And that period is, is really now, uh, where with today's technology, we can get a much more addressable piece of the market and with specific customers, uh, we can satisfy those, those airlines' fleets. And then longer term, we think that those purpose-built, fully integrated aircraft, those that take several years to develop to put in all those great new technologies, um, take us on a little longer timeline, but ultimately give us really full, full range and authority uh, in the short-haul segments. Now, where do these aircraft go, and, and what does it mean, and what if, what if there was a 40% increase in, in air travel? at the short haul uh, basis? What if instead of driving 300 miles, we decided, well, no, that's a distance I don't drive. I fly that distance. I've changed my criteria, and more and more of us uh, maybe lower that because the cost of air travel is, uh, is gone down, and uh, it doesn't have any CO2 shame. And when you get there, it's real easy to get an Uber or, or have ground transportation uh, when you get to where you really want to go. You don't really need to have your car with you. So what if that happened? Um, what would that mean for our airport infrastructure? So there's about 5,000 uh, airports in the United States, uh, but there's only about 400 that actually service commercial flights today. Uh, if we look at those 400 airports and we rank order them and how busy they are, and I learned today Denver is number five. I was surprised by that, big airport takes a lot of flights. But most of the time, we cram ourselves through the 50 busiest airports. 70% of air traffic goes through the 50 busiest airports in the US. And the others that take commercial traffic, the other 30% take us out above 400 airports. So there's a whole lot of underutilized capacity as far as the ability to land planes and uh, uh, utilize the airstrips and the storage uh, nearby. Certainly other infrastructure pieces would need to scale to support that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, there's some factoids there, but we think that there's a great chance for the expansion of business and the utilization of airports. But in order to electrify aviation, those airplanes need to be refueled. They need to be recharged. They need superchargers or ultrachargers or something at the airport. And if you do the math on this and you look at an airport the size of uh, uh, ASC, Pitkin County, uh, you'd see that tens of megawatts of power would be required to support an emerging electrification uh, in short haul if, uh, if more and more traffic was coming in. And so uh, to the extent I can contribute to the local dialogue, I think that's an important thing to consider. So I'll just uh, close a little bit with some comments about our company. Uh, we've been flying uh, this uh, Cessna 337. This is a plug-in hybrid. Uh, we've been flying it since earlier this year, as I mentioned. Uh, we've got a second version of this that we're going to put into fleet use with Mocha Lele Airlines uh, in the spring on a demo fleet basis. Their pilots will fly it uh, on their routes, and they'll, they'll get a sense of what it's like to have a hybrid aircraft uh, on the ground and in the air uh, serving the business. We've got a second version of this plane, or a third version, I should say, that uh, we're going to use for a test bed for uh, the Department of Energy to uh, test and fly uh, power electronics and new technologies uh, in the air. Um, and that'll happen uh, throughout next year and the, the year following. And a real interesting piece of work that we have that's funded by NASA is the planning for uh, the uh, hybridization of a, uh, this is a twin otter, but this is a 19 passenger short haul aircraft. Uh, it's used throughout the world and especially it's, it's known as a, a really uh, super uh, short haul, or excuse me, short landing and takeoff uh, aircraft. Gets in and out of a lot of uh, interesting places, uh, super durable. Uh, so we're working on a version of this that's a plug-in hybrid that reduces the fuel consumption and the CO2 by more than half 
and uh, we expect to start work on that uh, next year, uh, potentially something that will be demoing in 21. So we see the entry point for this today is, does not depend on batteries that we don't have our hands on today. It does not depend on motors and propulsion technologies or wings or any aerodynamic improvements that we're not able to execute today. And so we're really trying to start in earnest. Uh, we, uh, we picked Vidro uh, Airlines, that's a Norwegian Airlines here, because uh, to, for the, 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 the show, show bird, it's because the, uh, the commitment of that airlines, the CEO of the company uh, is, uh, really wants to take uh, his company to uh, a, uh, an electrified basis uh, for uh, all of their airline flights uh, throughout the domestic uh, flights in uh, Norway. Uh, they think they can do this perhaps by 2030, and we at least commend uh, our customer, uh, potential customer, for their strong interest in what uh, we're hoping to provide for them. And that, in summary, our perspective is that uh, electric uh, aviation is uh, motivated uh, by environmental concerns. Uh, emerging customer demands and for the business and the opportunity to lower costs. Uh, lower operating costs, we think, uh, will result in more direct flight operations and therefore, on a secondary basis, uh, further improve uh, travel efficiency for people in their time, but also for consumption and for CO2 in the environment. Uh, high specific energy batteries uh, for practical fully electric aircraft are in development, and, uh, but the, the market may not be fully ready for that today, but partially uh, electric aircraft uh, can be sustained and supported with today's level of technologies. Um, airports in general are unutilized, and even if we have an expansion in air traffic, um, the basics are there, but what needs to be added are the electric power infrastructure and uh, related uh, electric power delivery pieces uh, to make that all work. And finally, uh, major support for electrified aviation is emerging um, in the private industry, uh, including airlines and uh, certainly uh, among uh, the voices of uh, at least leading consumers and how they feel and by uh, governments that have taken a strong interest. And with that, I'll thank you. So some of you may recall the the, the time Ellen DeGeneres uh, was introducing Paul McCartney, and, and she said, now a, a man who needs no introduction, and she walked off the stage. Um, I feel that way a little bit with uh, Amory Levins, particularly with this crowd. Um, so the man with the, the longest resume is going to get the shortest introduction. Uh, Amory is no stranger to this community. Uh, he's no stranger to any of us who've been involved in, in uh, the energy uh, sector. Uh, Amory is a, a, a visionary uh, and thinker uh, in the energy space and, and more broadly um, uh, virtually without peer. Um, the founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, a great friend uh, of the Aspen Institute, uh, and always just a lot of fun to listen to. Amory, come on up. <coughs> see if this yes uh, <clears throat> Kevin and, and Pete have laid some great foundations on which I'm going to build a longer term and even more ambitious framework for where I think aviation could be headed uh, and what that implies uh, I'll sketch a little bit for the plans of this community in a very long-lived asset uh, that needs to cope with change uh, well beyond what we're normally thinking about. And what I'll show you <coughs> is adapted from a talk that a major airframe maker had me do, keynoting the Air Transport Action Group, which is the global industry grouping of aviation. Um, and then two days later, the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, which is the UN body dealing with aviation. 
uh, that was in May. <coughs> um, so I'm going to sketch an efficiency revolution from my perspective working on efficiency across all sectors and, and around the world. A little perspective, uh, if aviation were a country, its annual carbon emissions would sit between Japan and Germany, around 850 million metric tons of CO2 a year. That's less than 3% of the global total, but by 2050, the forecasted growth plus reductions committed by other sectors could bring aviation's share to around 20% without a change of course. And that trajectory is misaligned with science-based targets. Already for many of us, flying is our largest source of personal greenhouse gas emissions, and for some it does cause shameful feelings. Um, I'm going to leave out a lot of worthy improvements already being made in routing, route architectures, airports, ground ops, and so on. To focus, although I'll have one slide on airports, I, I want to focus on two main opportunities to protect and advance the industries and the traveling public's interests by decoupling aviation from climate. First, briefly commenting on sustainable aviation fuels, and then second, exploring radical airplane efficiency and how to expedite its profitable development and scaling. Now, to protect both the climate and themselves, airlines now focus on operational fuel savings and usually a lot less on sustainable aviation fuel uh, because that's typically costing them two or three times as much as Jet A, so the scale up is slow. With profit margins averaging under 12 bucks a ticket, carriers don't want to raise their biggest operating cost. Conversely, even in as favorable an environment as California, biof biofuel producers make over 20% higher margin making road fuels than sustainable aviation fuel, which therefore is not a top priority for promising new potential producers like fulcrum and carbon engineering. So I was <coughs> glad to see those plants on the boards that Kevin mentioned, but Without a clear market, lenders and investors will largely stay on the sidelines. Supportive airport policies like Seattle's can help. And there's another option that could too. The Energy Transitions Commission's findings imply that decarbonizing jet airplane movement would add 10 or 20 percent to the average ticket price. But if airlines cannot cover this gap, businesses flying in their airplanes can. So Rocky Mountain Institute has been developing the Resilient Sustainable Aviation Fuel, or RSAF, credit concept to create a project or a product that could bridge that gap. And it would look like the renewable energy credits, RECs, that are widely used to unbundle and transfer uh, solar and wind-generated electricity's clean attributes to buyers. But RSAF should be worth more because they're truly additional and they cover the actual price gap. RSAF credits may also be linkable to new production capacity, similar to RMI's successful spin-off, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, which Rogers by Miranda Valentine leads. And they're akin to what Sky Energy's board now program with a single binary refinery uh, does and that can be compatible with other regulatory regimes. So this is kind of a, a nerdy thing just to say there is an emerging financial instrument that could help cover the cost gap while we scale up and, and shrink the gap. Some airports are also emerging as efficiency leaders. Seattle is uh, leading in promoting sustainable aviation fuels and other airports in other ways. San Francisco's international terminal, uh, terminal starting at a respectable energy use intensity or EUI baseline of 179 thousand BTU per square foot year, pushed past its contract goal with an EUI of 62, so they cut it by nearly threefold. For comparison, Rocky Mountain Institute's office in Basalt is 13, so they're five times lower than that, but of course without baggage handling and TSA checkpoints. Nonetheless, there's still a long way to go in airports, and I think it's sort of obvious, many of us here, that anything we build here ought to be net positive. Uh, and it, it uh, often will not cost materially more or any more to do that. Now, 
San Francisco Airport has committed to net zero energy and water and waste with an aggressive timeline, and they've tripled the design efficiency of their new international terminal. Norway, and specifically Oslo Airport, is pursuing audacious goals around the Aerotropolis concept that will produce more energy than it consumes, and its system solution integrates road transport and energy storage to support needs well beyond the fence line. Uh, Cochin in India has over 13 megawatts of solar, more than the airport needs, and after a six-year payback, it will get free electrons. By then, we'll have airplanes running on them. Meanwhile, airports' renewable power can work nicely with customers' electric cars. Today, if you drive your charged-up electric car to the Green Stadium in Amsterdam, you can get free parking, you get into the soccer game free, and the stadium runs on the plugged-in cars, leaving you enough juice to get home with. That's pretty cool. Uh, airports have fairly big buildings and very big land areas, so they can harness the powerful business case that makes modern renewables, chiefly solar and wind power, capture already two-thirds of the world's net additions of generating capacity. And as airplanes start to run on a mix of electricity and for very long hauls hydrogen, both can be produced on the airport's own land, which is just sitting there. But while we urgently seek to scale up sustainable aviation fuels and efficient, increasingly autonomous airports, we also need airplanes that use radically less fuel, and that in turn makes electrification cheaper, easier, and faster. And above all, this means lightweight. If you take a pound out of a typical airplane, that's worth about $1,000 in present valued fuel cost. Even more on long flights where each gallon you want to land with requires another gallon to carry it across the Pacific. I was once hitchhiking on a military tanker, KC-135R, and I noticed a lot of heavy things that didn't need to be there. So I briefed my observations to a couple of Air Force Two Stars, and that afternoon they launched a treasure hunt that found $2 billion worth of weight and hence fuel savings in that class, and then over $10 billion on all heavy classes they run. That's weight that nobody had been responsible or rewarded for taking out. Likewise, as a, an airport passenger, air, airline passengers frequently as this morning, uh, I, I notice uneven attention to weight. They sweat the details of lightweight toilet paper and magazines, but overlook heavy tray tables and galley carts. And I think airframe makers could do a lot more with basic structures. Our lightest big passenger planes are still only half carbon fiber composites by weight. But 23 years ago, Dave Taggart at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works led for DARPA the design of a 90%, 95% carbon composite advanced tactical fighter airframe that was one-third lighter but two-thirds cheaper than the 72% metal base design. Let that sink in a minute. And that's still sitting on the shelf, uh, the airframe makers have not yet got to that level of ambition. And it does require revolutionary design mentality, designing in the future, not in the past. When the Soviets shot down Francis Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane in 1960, Kelly Johnson, <coughs> leading the Skunk Works, did not say, I'm going to design a slightly better U-2. He said, in paraphrase, I want to own the skies for decades, so we'll design a Blackbird. I don't know how, but we'll figure out. And they did. It took about 13 months. And Johnson understood that such an airplane was impossible within the conventional design context, because design is like a rubber band. If you try to stretch it too far from the conventional design space, you encounter more and more resistance, and eventually it breaks. But if instead you jump to the new design space you aspire to, you can stretch the rubber band back to fit technologies not yet ripe, and then as they mature, the rubber band relaxes to where you want to be. Otherwise, you never get there. Now, such visionary leadership by Ulrich Kranz enabled BMW to develop the i3 carbon fiber electric car that I drive. It reportedly made money from the first unit off the assembly line, 
and Sandy Monroe, <clears throat> the normally understated dean of automotive costing in Detroit, called it the most significant vehicle since the Model T and the most advanced vehicle on the planet. You see, its carbon fiber is paid for the, by the batteries that its lightness saves, and fewer batteries mean faster recharging. Its integrative design makes the weight saving snowball far more than Detroit normally assumes. Its manufacturing is radically frugal. It's made with a third the normal capital and water and half the normal energy space and time. No wonder they make money on it. It confirms the elimination of the two hardest and costliest steps in automaking, the conventional body and paint shops. It's much better for workers and <clears throat> the synergies between ultralight materials and electric traction quadruple its efficiency to 124 miles per gallon equivalent without compromise and with many driver advantages. The one I like best is half the normal turn radius. Uh, <clears throat> so think about this in an airplane context and link it with that Skunk Works fighter example I gave earlier. A process that our team developed in this valley made this uh, test piece for military ballistic helmets, my well-known carbon cap, in one minute 12 years ago. And it then made a lot of airplane parts for various manufacturers, uh, like composite window frames that went from concept to commercial flight in six months. Uh, and then the technology we, we sold to a tier one press maker uh, came out in 2013 in a version that can, uh, sorry, 2016, that can now make a complex two by two meter carbon fiber part in one minute, where that machine can make over a million smaller aerospace parts per year. Ultralighting cars this way, as we just saw, is approximately free. So it's paid for by a two thirds smaller propulsion system and by radically simpler and cheaper automaking. I would suggest that ultralighting airpl airplanes is worth even more. So we're just at the leading edge of starting to take a lot of weight out of our planes. Now, to be sure, advanced composites are already incrementally replacing metal. Current trends include carbon fiber wings, elliptical fuselage forms that have a 787-like passenger compartment sitting on top of a skinnier 737-like cargo hold so you fit in more seats, more revenue, with less drag and less weight. But many components that are made of metal uh, today should not be. A 40-odd percent efficient jet engine saves over two units of fuel directly and more with mass decompounding for each one unit of mass or lift to drag ratio that you save in the airplane. So this multiplier say increases the value of saved fuel and of saving onboard electricity. Even quite an efficient 787 Dreamliner drawing about 400 kilowatts at cruise is not yet fully optimized. And optimization for <clears throat> whole system life cycle value might reveal some very different strategies for thermal comfort. It might show, to make up an example, that replacing a standard $20 coffee pot with, say, a $200 vacuum super insulated internal element coffee pot might save thousands of dollars worth of fuel a year. Uh, Boeing estimated that optimizing electric loads might add a couple of percentage points to the 787's roughly 20% gain in fuel efficiency and even more when smart wiring and power management take out a lot of heavy copper and complex wiring. Of course, airplanes have been getting more efficient for a long time, building on, on Kevin's graph. The one certified from 1960 to 2000 cut fuel intensity by 7%, 70%, uh, half of it by better engines, half by better airframes. And that progress is on such a steady, predictable course that Boeing's NMA or 797, they haven't named it yet, is expected to hit our 2004 bullseye for 2025 within a percent or two. 
But because of uncertain and often cash short customers, the industry's trajectory is way too slow. It raises efficiency by about 20% per generation. Next generation options are well known. They're effective, they're profitable. I won't go into these now. And a lot more are available. In fact, more ambitious combinations of current technologies can boost airplane efficiency cost effectively by about three to five fold. And these upper three designs from Boeing, NASA, and MIT are a decade old. The lower three are several years old. But both sets can save about 50 to 80 percent of the fuel versus today's fleet. Uh, they do simple things like bracing the wings with a strut or a truss so you can make the wing much longer for efficiency. <clears throat> By the way, uh, airplanes have to fit within an 80 meter box at the gate. But I think what we're likely to end up with and what I would suggest designing this airport for is much longer wings that fold up when needed. Boeing's been selling those hinges for decades. That part's not hard. But then when they unfold to fly with, the plane is much more efficient. And I think it will be very logical for purpose-built electric planes to be of that kind. That doesn't mean they have to be big, heavy planes. It means that you have to have room for the wingspan. We'll be using a lot more composite structures, hybrid electric propulsion, like we've heard about. So you have gas turbine assisted takeoff and range reserve, but electric crews. Potted or buried propulsors like the upper middle one where the, it's, it's buried in the tail and it does what's called boundary layer ingestion, uh, sucking in air that's going back along the fuselage. We'll have some blended wing body designs, especially for freight. Those are the kind of flying wing things you see there and other expanding innovations. A, a lot of very exciting new ones in aerodynamics that I'm not even counting here. And even simple changes are effective. Sometimes if you're flying an old airplane, you can look out the window as it lands and see the flaps extended by a hydraulic and mechanical system that the Del Tessar, the wizard of electric actuators, uh, farm boy gearhead, he correctly calls farm machinery. It's heavy, unreliable, costly to buy, costly to maintain, and he would replace it with a five times more durable, far more reliable and reparable, much cheaper hinge line electric actuator that cuts the overall system weight by a factor three. But now, like the Wright brothers' bendable, sorry, uh, <coughs> canvas and wood, so let me see if I can get this to animate. Um, Flight surfaces can morph in real time. Yeah, there you go. Uh, to fly, adapt to flight conditions, that leaves the surface and the airflow smooth. There's two different methods. The first one should enter commercial use next year. Uh, that's quite exciting stuff. And the second approach just produced at MIT, a 4.3 meter test structure 59 times, not percent, times less dense than a typical airplane wing. Uh, that is, the structure has the strength of bulk elastomer, but the gossamer density of aerogel. It eliminates movable flight surfaces, but every part of the entire shape passively adapts moment by moment to optimize continuously for real-time flight conditions, just like a bird's wing. And thousands of such identical molded polymer little lattice parts can be assembled by swarms of programmed robots or grad students, whichever are cheaper, uh, and into an airplane of any desired shape. So this is still lab stuff, but just to let you know, there, there are cutting edge techniques opening quite revolutionary prospects for lightweighting and aerodynamics and cost reduction. Uh, and these hook together miniature structures are as strong and stiff as solid structures, but they're up to 90% air. They can be self-healing. They're not even using carbon fiber. After carbon fiber for tenfold stronger could come Marillon's carbon nanotube structures with up to tenfold higher mechanical performance. And now we can make similar nanotubes from sugar, water, and sunlight via the bacterial enzymes that hummingbirds use to weave their nests. 
Airbus collaborated with Autodesk to generate this 45% uh, percent lighter partition at the upper right for the A320 and some exciting design concepts at the lower right for whole airplanes. And of course, the same design logic applies to 3D printed metal parts as it does to bird bones. Nature is really rich in great aeronautic designs. Here's a tropical cucumber seed that can glide for hundreds of meters, leaded wing body. Not to mention the California condor, besides all its advanced geometries and structures and controls, I especially like its full, fully integrated system design and advanced manufacturing techniques. <clears throat> if only we were as smart as condors. And in an emergent application of biomimicry, Jay Harmon, an Australian naturalist and sea captain, has imitated the Fibonacci structure in natural vortices to make super efficient pump and fan rotors, like this tulip-shaped pump rotor at the right that can spin underwater at thousands of RPM with no cavitation. Now, your body has about 60,000 miles of fractal blood vessels down to the little capillaries, and if they had the design and friction of standard industrial piping, uh, you would need a heart bigger than your chest, which would be really inconvenient. But your one and a half watt heart actually suffices because your bloodstream uses laminar vortex flow, a different regime, and such rotors can raise fan and pump efficiency by 20 or 30 percent. Uh, and now computed and observed pump behavior match up nicely yielding a bunch of diverse, super-efficient fans, propulsors, and hulls. Some are now inter entering the market, and their efficiency gains are independent of scale and of Reynolds number, so any fellow nerds present will be quite surprised by that statement, but it means that the same stuff that works for pumps can work for uh, airplane uh, propulsing rotors. And uh, converting another example, standard airflow over a fuselage to laminar vortex flow or toroidal flow regimes like going through a series of smoke rings can cut the hull drag in one early trial by about 14%. Um, in a small initial example, Harman has done some small and light but precisely compound curved duplex winglets that improve lift to drag ratio 2% and make wake vortices weaker and shorter so you can space uh, takeoffs closer together safely. Now, turning now to propulsion, the National Academies expect several more decades of 7% per decade gains in gas turbines efficiency. It's actually percentage points, I believe, from the current 55 plus percent. Uh, GE recently 3D printed complex fuel nozzles that help make one engine a tenth more efficient. And here's a business jet turbofan they 3D printed 10% more power, 5% less weight, 20% less fuel, 99% fewer parts. That's where engines are headed. Now, at least three firms have doubled the energy density of smartphone batteries to four or 500 watt hours per kilo. And the National Academies three years ago <clears throat> said that would take 20 years, but it already happened. That enables short haul electric airplanes and ultimately perhaps even medium haul with emergent battery types, lithium air, lithium sulfur. And large area batteries or ultra capacitors or both might also eventually form the skin and structure of the airplane rather than being a separate item with its own weight. Renewably charged uh, electric airplanes can offer zero carbon flights with less noise, no knocks, no particulates, and op optionally vertical takeoff and landing using a small pad, not a runway. <clears throat> that could shift a lot of airport operations to downtown roofs. And smaller versions, NASA X-57, Aviation, Ampere, Zunum's future models demonstrate viability. Wright Electric's vision uh, to provide 150 passenger aircraft, air electric aircraft is interesting because short hauls, like we have a lot here, are more carbon intensive per passenger mile. And descent and landing can even recover some electricity just like regenerative braking in an electric car. By the way, Heathrow has waived landing fees for a year for the first electric airplane. 
Norway has a pioneering national goal to electrify nearly all domestic flights by 2040, many by 2025. Hybrid electric planes will offer ranges up to 1,500 miles. That covers about 82% of their domestic trips. And what makes electric flight now practical is not just batteries, it's many diverse technologies converging in a vast explosion of creativity. Although only a few models have yet flown, upwards of 100 startups are reported, mainly in the US, China, and Germany. First certifications expected around next year. And whether or not electric vertical takeoff and landing air taxis become common as some expect, electrification is going to present new challenges and opportunities to airports and carriers, especially those with fortress hub rather than point-to-point -point route architectures. United? This might alter some of our pricing here. Uh, competition between advanced biofuels, electricity, power to fuel, and hydrogen, I think is going to turn airplanes into integrated transport and energy hubs, probably using distributed models. But electric air taxis will almost certainly use a lot more energy than electric ground taxis. Collisions are a lot more serious in the air than on the ground. And if you like congestion in two dimensions, you'll love it in three dimensions. So all of this is going to need a lot of careful foresight. How about very long hauls? Well, liquid hydrogen <clears throat> is almost three times lighter than jet fuel, but four times bulkier. So it's going to need new airplane designs called cryoplanes. Boeing's 767 study found 13 years ago that a well-designed liquid hydrogen plane with re-optimized engines could be 10 or 15 percent more efficient than the current version. That's enough to offset the liquefaction energy of the hydrogen. And today's cheap renewable electricity makes liquid hydrogen far environmentally superior to jet fuel and economically interesting for intercontinental flight. There's a Dutch designer, Peters, who thinks a fuel cell and high temperature superconducting motors can push airplanes three to five fold efficiency gains up to seven or six or seven X. And I think that would even go a bit higher with some new aerodynamics recently developed at NASA. To summarize then, our 2011 synthesis reinventing fire showed how US mobility could be greatly enhanced as you see in the subtitle while phasing out oil with an internal rate of return over 17%. We can first get efficient by technologies either included or overlooked in the 2010 official forecast. We could use vehicles more productively and then we could switch fuels, but you see there's not much fuel left to switch. Super efficient autos can use any mixture of electricity, hydrogen fuel cells, and advanced biofuels, these three items. Heavy trucks and airplanes can realistically use advanced biofuels or hydrogen. Double efficiency ships can use biofuels, liquid hydrogen, or ammonia, but no vehicles will need oil. And any biofuels needed could be made two-thirds from waste without displacing cropland or harming climate or soil. Now, so far, this U.S. vision looks on track as the little star shows our 2011 reinventing fire graph matches right where it should be the top of the orange biofuel wedge, and the global equivalent could be broadly similar. Let me end with a challenging opportunity, uh, which got a lot of interest from the operators and builders of airplanes at those two conferences. For a decade, we've had the technology to create three to five-fold more efficient airplanes if somebody would make them and somebody would buy them. But why should we take a century to do that incrementally when we can leapfrog straight to it? See, major airplanes, air, airplane buyers, even if they have the capital, are understandably risk averse. Airframe makers don't want to risk huge development investments for a radically better product that might not sell. So incrementalism continues as we squander fuel and money and precious time, taking a century to apply what we already know. But the climate cl crisis uh, will not wait. Business as usual won't work. The license to operate will erode. 
shareholders and our children will judge us negligent. So what if a consortium of major customers, airlines, leasing firms, delivery and air logistic firms, the Pentagon, relieved the airframe maker's market risk so they could fully focus their skills and ambition? The buyers could solicit a super efficient airplane, say 4X, by publishing very demanding specs and collectively committing to buy X copies a year for Y years at price Z from whoever first brings them to market, eliciting and rewarding innovations for the airplanes they'll buy anyway, but unbundling buying airplanes from buying innovation. And that unbundling changes the supplier's culture and brings out the best talent of their best innovators. That will yield a very different product slate and reduce risk to both parties, but most of all to airplane buyers. This so-called golden carrot method has worked well since 1990 for over 20 diverse solicitations in countries from Sweden to France, from America to India. It's never been used before for something as big and costly and complex as an airplane, but it's time we seriously considered it for airplanes. That could decouple flying from climate change. It could also, unlike offsets, slash fuel costs and the risks of fuel price volatility. And it could release a huge burst of innovation that could transform aviation forever. So what are we waiting for? I think we have to think about that kind of future as we think about our airport. Thank you.